I'm Will Hedrick. And I'm Jordan Schaffer. And this is Dog Years and Timestamps, a book club podcast. We're making it, dude. We're making it through. Making it through. This was maybe the longest section of reading? Yeah, think? I think so. I think, at least for me, it was like the longest section of listening. You know, it was, mm-hmm. it was, the first section I think was, well, actually, you know, the middle and the second one and this one might have been the in equally as long because I remember that yeah. first section being shorter than we thought it was. Yeah. And then this last one, bef- sorry, the second and last one being relatively long and mm-hmm. like I, in in my mind i keep thinking of it in in like time stamp chunks <laughs> you know yeah. so it, the first I read one this was like section four hours all in one day yesterday oh, okay and i think i started because you know i woke up and i messed around a little bit and i gave my dog a bath and then i went and did some weeding in the front yard and then i got cleaned up and then that's when i started reading and I was watching the Astros and then probably at about midnight was whenever I finished. So okay. I think I was reading for about pretty easily eight hours. Yeah. That's like like the amount of book that I had left to listen to for like the entirety of the book today was, um, it said eight hours, but I think, um, but like the section that we had was about like six of those <laughs> so mm-hmm. um yeah i mean and i'm and i'm listening to a faster speed than like i let them talk and i know you were mm-hmm. multitasking and stuff you're a fast reader so um but yeah i mean it was a pretty good solid section i thought yeah. i almost thought like there was like if if it was another writer and not stephen king like i almost feel like it would have been like this is the point like after the last the se- after our second episode i feel like mm-hmm. that would have been the spot that would have been like all right that's the end of this book Let's start with an entirely new novel and then we'll right. release the second because that like the only difference would have been that it probably would have been like a much longer drawn out escape. Like it would have been much more high intensity escape plan. And then right, once he had yeah. successfully escaped, then it would have been like, all right, we start the next book picking back up where like mm-hmm. Luke comes off, you know, and, th- and then because that, that's sort of the vibe I got. Like as, as we were as I was listening, I was I was like, this this could very easily have been a second book. But since it was Stephen King and I know he likes to do big time jumps, I don't, I don't know if necessarily he always does. But I know with it, we were talking about it last mm-hmm. week. It's like a 600 page book that right. he has like a 33 year time jump in. Right. There's definitely a lot. And at least, you know, in the two books that we've read for the show by him. There's definitely two different stories that takes place in each one. Yeah, you're right. There's because like Salem's Lot is all build up to the event where we, we start even, fighting the vampires yeah. and then it's fighting the vampires and then you know the time skip where they're in mexico and all that sort of shit but like th- that would be two movies mm-hmm. and this would be two movies probably yeah. as well in the same way that you're saying and maybe a, a different author that you know only has like you know 250 to 350 page books would mm-hmm. split it where we started reading this week you know yeah maybe even like a beginning like just to see like hey maybe let's see if people even like this so let i'll come out with like the the first right. chunk of the novel mm-hmm. whereas stephen king is like i'm just gonna come out with the whole thing and people are gonna buy <laughs> right yeah. i don't th- i don't know if he even markets it to that anymore i'm sure yeah. he, i'm sure he has you know integrity with his work where he's like you know i'm gonna write this and if people like it they like it and if they don't they probably don't probably prefers to and in the way that you know writers from an older generation mm-hmm. Uh, generally did they just prefer to just have their their story in a book <laughs> yeah as opposed to you know the in an idea that we've explored you know in the past you know do people write with the intention of having series that's a great you point know? Uh, where I appreciate Stephen that. King was just like, I have this idea for a story and it's going to be a book. And then I'm going to have another idea for a different story and it's going to be a book. Right. <laughs> I, I appreciate that a lot with this, with this story in particular, because, because he definitely goes back. Like if there's more to tell with that story, I feel like this is going to sound kind of lame because, or kind of cheesy because I've, I've heard him talk about different characters and how they, well, like with Salem's Lot, I, we talked about how when I think I read a little bit about Stephen King writing writing that book and he didn't know necessarily what was going to happen because I think he wanted it to be like I don't think he necessarily wanted the good guys to win and and it could be argued that they didn't win Mm -hmm. but I think that they all turned and became a lot more courageous than he was expecting like I remember him saying like oh yeah these characters turned out different than I was expecting like I don't go in thinking like this has to be what happens like he goes and in the heat of the moment when he's writing he lets that character like come out of him and it's uh mm-hmm. it's really nice is for this story in particular because 
you know, like if there is more to tell with the story, like he will come back, like uh, with Doctor No Sleep, that uh, the movie we talked about a couple of weeks ago, how right. it's like the sequel to The Shining. Mm-hmm. It's like he had more to tell. Like I, I don't know right. when he decided he had more It'd to be tell. Interesting but to it know, was... and we'll obviously find out <laughs> next week. But how does this book end? Right, because if it ends with the total destruction of the Institute. Even though that we know that there's some other party that they report to, Is you the know, they talk over? about the phone or whatever. <laughs> I know they keep saying the world's going to end. But like if if the end of this book is the the full and systematic destruction of the Institute and everything that it is behind mm-hmm. and is behind it, then how could there be something else to return to, you know? That's a great... Yeah, great but if it ends like in just like, and then they went their separate ways, then yeah, we could probably come back. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could come back. Well, I mean, we'll see. But yeah, it, it could... just seems like it's gonna be like I, I just don't see how there could possibly be like a second thing. Although there is the, it, like I briefly mentioned, there we find out that there's of course somebody that Mrs. Sixby answers to because it's what we assume to be a government operation. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's somebody above her, but it appears to be like somebody that's in some other sort of like small, you know, organization that maybe doesn't mm-hmm. report directly to the president necessarily. Yeah, but, in you my know, mind, it's like Dr. Sort of the Evil. The shadow government. <laughs> the shadow government. Yeah, in my head, it's literally like a Dr. Evil type person, like sitting in a cave, like with their cat, like stroking it and just, <laughs> I know that's the cliche evil doctor. But I don't think like... that they're... <laughs> Whatever that organization is, isn't like evil, evil. Right. That's a good point. I don't think they're They're evil in that they've lost their humanity, that they think it's okay to do this to kids, but their goal is saving the world. Yeah. And literally everybody there believes it. Yeah. They definitely believe it. So either they have one of the biggest conspiracies within their organization where they've brainwashed everyone to believe that they are saving the world, like how kind of north korea is one of the biggest conspiracies they're on their own intranet you know like they, they they're not right. allowed to have anything else other than what they're told so mm-hmm. that's argued that like they're living in their own bubble which until they get like the the glass ceiling shattered they like had no idea and a lot of right. i think that's the big thing now over there is that like a lot of them do know uh what it's like on the outside <laughs> so anyway enough about them <laughs> but uh one thing that was super interesting is just like we, we kind of learn in in this section that like there's like that age old saying like there's strength in numbers but we also learned that like because of the strength in their numbers i think they're able to communicate with other institutes around the world like the kids are communicating with the other that would kids be interesting. of the institute yeah if if there are other institutes oh you don't think there are i mean so far there's no reason to believe that there is other than the fact that this hidden thing exists so of course there might be other hidden things but yeah. there's been no sort of direct clue about it you know gotcha yeah um so i mean there certainly could be and that could be a branch that he takes if he decides to return to this specific you know plane of his greater universe mm-hmm. then yeah he could definitely use that as a way you know like all of a sudden the Avester gets a signal from some German kid yeah. or something like that. And so now we've got to go save them or something like that. But I feel like that's a little too adventure for Stephen King. Yeah, I doubt that they'd make him go to a different area to save any other kids in the Institute, like in a different Institute, because it already feels like they don't want to save, like it feels like the the kids want to save the people from front half. But I don't, I don't feel like that's really on Luke's agenda. Like it's more just like, override the institute i I think that luke wants to save everybody that he can right and that's you know and we'll see if he has like some sort of like you know sneaky reveal trump card that even we don't know yet whenever Mm -hmm. they get because right now they're going back right Mm -hmm. and what he has stated as his goal is to save all of his all the friends of his that he can and so that's why he's going to try and make a deal with um, Stackhouse. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's still got Sigsby and Dr. Evans as hostage and all that sort of stuff. So it seems to be like there's going to be some sort of like trade deal. And part of the deal is that, you know, that they don't go public with the information about the Institute or something like yeah. that. But then the very last line that we read is Luke says, Stackhouse thinks I'm coming to him, but I'm coming for him. So is Luke's actual idea to go there, get them all in one place, get his friends safe, and then just nuke them? <laughs> you know? it, it, it almost seems like he he has to. It almost seems like they're gonna have to use their power to like 
over. Well, they definitely have to. Now that the kids there at the Institute have figured out how to do it. Yeah. And even Luke recognizes that they've figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. So now he just needs to get there and get the literal, you know, you know, five page pamphlet on how to use your powers from them. And then they can basically do anything they want to, I suppose. So it's just a matter of what is the trickery and the smarts that obviously Luke has Mm -hmm. to get the kids out of the corridor and free so that they can then, I guess, just turn around and annihilate the people at the Institute. Yeah. Because I don't think that they, I don't think that Luke has any intention of letting, uh, at the very least, um, Sigsby Stackhouse and Hendrix survive. He may or may not give a shit about the different caretakers or whatever. Like, who cares? They're not smart enough to start this back up yeah, again. Yeah, the only one he really but had. But they're any the ringleaders, and they're the ones who are definitely like the uh, the center of everybody's hate mm-hmm. more than anything because they run the show. Yeah, yeah, and the only one he had any any sort of feelings for or a relationship with is, is she killed herself. So right. Um, did you think that was going to happen? Did you see that coming with Maureen? Um, I don't know if I saw it coming, but when it happened, I was like, that I wouldn't makes sense. say that I saw. Yeah, same. I guess pretty much the same thing. It didn't surprise me in the slightest, right? Especially just because we knew she was terminal. Like mm-hmm. or, that's the right word, right? When I mean, she's not gonna make it. Yeah. Okay. Like she, we knew that she. Whatever it was that she had was yeah. gonna be the thing that took her. Right. So, so unless she, you know, one upped it with herself. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I yeah, I don't think that it was telegraphed, mm-hmm. but it like obvious now you know yeah. like well duh <laughs> yeah now what was your favorite part in this little section because i like like i said i felt like this kind of brought it in like if it as if it was a new book like this is kind of i feel like if if we're going through the the plot tree of of a of a book i feel like we're we're back to like the rising action again you know like we're mm-hmm. or we're back to the beginning of this not necessarily like a reboot with the introduction but i think we're back at like a different rising action and i think that some stories can have I'm sure some stories have multiple arcs like that, but it does feel to me like this one has a rising, rising. We kind of got to like a, like a pre-climax state where we had like, just like the heat of the Institute and he was breaking out and then, and then now we're back to another rising action again, where we're, where it's the meeting of the characters and we're building up to the new climax that I don't think has happened yet. And that's obviously going to be when, in my, I, I think right. it'll be obviously when well, Luke, gonna be Luke gets whatever back. Whatever it is to... that happens at the, you know, the, yeah. the Institute. Or it could just be, you know, relatively low key. Because I think the the climax of this book was a sustained climax, which, you know, begins with the escape and ends with the shootout in Dupre. Okay. And then at this point, you know, we're still at the top there with the climax. And now we're, you know, at the 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 falling action to the resolution. Okay. Which is just like everything's going to, you know, coast down, whatever it is that happens at the Institute, even if it's. You know, as simple as, you know, what I had said where, you know, we get the kids out and then we just turn and kill them all. <laughs> that doesn't have to be this dramatic, you know, huge shootout that happened in Dupre. Mm-hmm. One, it can't because the Institute doesn't have all those same guns. <laughs> yeah. That everybody that they had down there. In the, and we're not the bringing an army. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it can't be as bombastic as the shootout was. Mm-hmm. It could definitely be tense. Oh, yeah. But tense doesn't necessitate having you you being in the climax you know mm-hmm. so I, I think that's how it's goes. certainly okay. since we that, know that this is that. a much shorter section of reading mm-hmm. you know it, it, it's the resolution is going to come quicker than we think okay unless they do the thing we're just like and then they went the separate ways and, and now wait for the next book that's that's one thing too that is going to be hard for me to wrap my my head around like i don't know how how it'll end because you know we have our adult main character and we have our like youth main character and short of it ending like salem's lot where the adult and the kid go off together like then what happens to the other kids like i can't i I can't imagine all all of the kids are gonna die either but then what do you do with all of the kids do you just take them to the you know the the institute orphanage (laughs) or like do we want to find new families for them like you know is avery gonna be able to do something like with their minds that maybe will make them I don't think they'd want to forget necessarily, but you know, cause they're dealing with PTSD type stuff, like, like torture, <laughs> you well, know, like several literal... of the kids are the, you know, the, the ones that live in the back half of back half are mm-hmm. completely, uh, they got incurable. They're, they got, got a word for it, right? They're broken forever. Um, it's like a 
like a slang term. For yeah, the, something the, like, like a boomer or like something Gork like that. Town or something Gork like that. Gorky, something like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they're uh, they're so far gone that they're completely unsavable. Yeah. So aside from just like you know, then you get into you know arguments of ethics. Like, are these kids that should just be put down? Or do we just have them exist in hospice for the rest of their lives where they literally, you know, can't enjoy anything? Well, I think, too, is that they have stronger psychic ability. Because they're incapable of thought. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's the thing, too, is, like, if you can harness their power with everybody else's, then you can just, like, use them as, like, a booster pack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd have to yeah. literally learn how to use everybody's power together. And if you can get these... If you can get these um, I don't know, I guess, I guess literally brain dead people, <laughs> you know, to, to, that's the hard part. I, I feel like to convince a brain dead person to help out, even if like you can convince them. Well, they're them. not convincing them to do anything. We know how this works now. Yeah. The, it's, it's purely by I mean, virtue of the ones who are capable of thinking, banding together to, you know, become like a light that then the brain dead moths with you know which are just they say it multiple times they're just the batteries exactly they attract themselves to you know that focus of you know focus and just lend raw power to their direction yeah i guess in my in my mind i was like what makes them want to do it other than i guess just literally being like a moth to the flame so that's Mm -hmm. a good way to say that yeah there must be something like innate in I'm trying to make it all real. There, there must be something innate in our human DNA that makes us want right. to help. <laughs> that's not it. It's just that's the story. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. How, how do you like it, man? You, you've been really enjoying it, or like, is it kind of is it living up living up to your expectations? I'm really as of two weeks it, ago. Yeah. Or? I don't know that I expected anything other than it was going to be a Stephen King book, mm-hmm. and you know, therefore, at a base level, uh, just good writing. Even if the story ends up being something that I don't care for, it's just good writing. Yeah. Which is, you know, better than other things that we've read, you know, just yeah. from an appreciable standpoint. Um, but as I've read it, I've really enjoyed it. So, yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm really I've been happy with it. I think I said it last week, but I've been recommending it to everybody. Um, and my mom's reading it. Um, that's the only one that's taken my advice. But mm. <laughs> a few other people have been talking about wanting to read more this month. And, and uh, you know, I've told them, hey, pick this one up. It's it's a great read. It's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, uh, there's some some things that, like, I missed uh, just from, you know, the from listening that, like, that you brought up. Like, uh, how there was that Salem's Lot reference. Yeah. And I just completely missed that and, like, rewrote it in my head that it was. <laughs> That it could be just like a reference from the book itself, like from its own book. <laughs> like right, <when> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I really like it. I think it's living up to everything I want. Like today I was walking around work listening and just like, I wasn't like jaw dropped like I was last week, but I was mm-hmm. laughing with the characters when they were doing things that were working out and just like, I was nervous with Avery. Like, you know, like I didn't want him to get tortured, but then when he got tortured and got near the brink of death, that like awoke his other abilities, which is like, right. And we didn't have to experience it this time. That was nice. I do appreciate that. We came in at the end. And really (laughs) that's only because we needed narratively Avery to be able to become stronger so that he could then lead the kids to do stuff. And That's so really, him, I really like that because him going into the water character. tank is literally just uh, Sigsby and Stackhouse being bitter that right. he helped the uh, Luke get out, and it backfired. There was no yeah. reason, you know, clinically to have Avery do that, mm-hmm. or even as a part of their testing, they were just like, "We're mad at him, so let's torture him and then send <laughs> him to back half," which is. You know, I mean, really I, transparent writing. I, I love. Like, I need I a reason to enhance him. And get him back there. So let's just use the, you know, the vengeful malice of these two people who up until this point have not had vengeful malice against any of the kids. I mean, the lady that hits people, didn't isn't she the one that like went back for him? No. Who was the one who went back? Who, like who went back? And the, the order to him? put Avery in the tank comes from Stackhouse. And then Sigsby says, yes, that's a good idea. And Stackhouse and Sigsby have not shown any malice. They're just there to do their jobs mm-hmm. that they believe in. And then suddenly for them to have I, it... I don't agree with that. 
I think they've shown malice a they lot. Absolutely I mean, haven't. Well, they don't agree even to disagree then, because like I definitely <laughs> they outright don't it. even think of the kids as people, and how can you have malice against something that you don't think as like a living thing? Well, they I mean, think of them as property for the purpose of their mission, and then they also recognize them as you know being heroic tools. They're constantly talking about that. Right. I'm just saying, like I definitely felt malice. Like that didn't seem out of character at all. I didn't think it was lazy. I, I just I I. I saw. I mean, that that felt right, especially because they didn't see it coming, like that it would enhance the powers. Like they didn't know that was going to happen. Like they know that putting people through near death experiences enhance their powers, but they didn't know that doing it to Avery would make well had the possibility to enhance their powers. Right. I mean, and one of the very few that it had successfully been done on was Luke, who was successful in hiding from them that it had happened. Yeah, but that's. I mean, we learn as the omnipotent, like, reader that, like, you know, near-death experience, in, like, seems to heighten their power. At least well, that's... It has the capability to, which is the theory that they already have and why they do it. Right. So why why wouldn't... You know what I mean? Like, the fact that they didn't even think about it happening and it just, like, backfiring on them is... I don't know. I liked it. It was good. Well, it's a, it's just convenient storytelling. I mean, inconvenient because he wrote it. <laughs> he could have done no, it in any well, other way. You could have made Nick be in charge of everybody and killed off Avery. I thought Avery was going to die at one point. Like, I didn't think he was going to live. And then just well, the fact they, that he's like this scrawny, weak kid that never had anything to show Avery for But Avery is the most powerful even. one of them. I know, and so but, it, like, but literally as like a character, he is the weakest. Like literally as like all throughout his entire life, he grew up being this weak nobody character. He, none of us, he didn't have yeah. any friends. He didn't have anything. And now... But as like, we know, none of that matters in the Institute. I know, but I'm just saying now as a character, like he doesn't show any of those old tendencies. Like he's grown into his own, like he's now a leader, which doesn't happen typically to people that are... You know, like that are. Beat I would up say and, that happens very typically for characters and stories. <laughs> well, maybe a character in a story, but we already had that development through Luke. You know, like we already. I mean, Luke, Luke was, was already strong. I mean, he was already. He, I don't know if he was a leader, but he was always a strong character. You know, he was always. It says multiple confident. times that he was always very good with everybody and people. He was good with people, him for but stuff. I don't and, know if it said that they looked to him for stuff, but I know that he was always very confident. You know, and he was very smart. So I just I don't I don't know if he was necessarily a leader. A leader. <laughs> I mean, confidence, yeah. But I don't know. I, I would just say that that Avery had such a different like growth as a character that I I really enjoyed it. Just because typically he doesn't fit the bill of being a leader, and he never was until being forced through a lot of stuff. Then he had a role model kind of like that. You know, Luke wasn't even really a leader because Nikki was the leader of the group, and then Luke kind of came into his own, and then and then Avery kind of took the lead after that. Like it just. Is the natural progression in the natural order? I don't know. I liked it. Yeah, but none of that has anything to do with the convenience of him needing to go to back half to start the revolution. So how do we get him to back half? Oh, we have these two characters get mad and take a vengeful act, which ends up being the tool that makes him stronger so that he can then fulfill the role I need him to fulfill in back half. I mean, I guess... (laughs) <laughs> I just, I didn't see it as convenient story writing. I just saw it as that chick being pissed off that he didn't do what she wanted. And so she's like, fucking torture him. So let's torture him. This is our best torture method. Let's torture him. Like he's in nothing. Yeah, like but they've they're... never done anything like that before. Right. And because nothing just... like this has ever happened before. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary or like bizarre has ever happened to them. Like it's just been by the book this entire time. This is the first time a breakout's ever happened. You know, like nothing like this has ever happened. Yeah, of course they're going to be pissed. And then the kids got away with lying when they have like a lie detector right next to them. Like that lady, there was another person in the room that was like, I would have known if he lied. It's like, yeah, you would have known if he lied. Yeah, but then even then she she immediately (laughs) self admits that she was wrong to think so. Yeah. Because that those whole like three or four chapters where we're in Sigsby's head, Mm -hmm. she's thinking about how slack they've been over the past however many years and even herself thinking that she would know when a kid was lying and then was proven to not know whenever Avery was lying. So, like, even, like, I mean, there is no lie detector. The And even the one person who has constantly said, mm-hmm. you know, like, I know. You I know, can know, yeah. She then self-admits, oh, I was wrong there. You know, it's just yeah, there's everything no about Sigsby has just been, I live for this job. I believe in this job. I'm going to do this job the best that I can. I've been lazy lately. We've gotten complaints it, but that's going to change. That's, and that's just, why it fits so nothing perfectly has ever for been, her to flip out like that. But because, she doesn't have emotion about 
she, she doesn't let her emotion get into any of it until it gets into chaos and she gets scared like now she's scared so that mm-hmm. definitely makes sense for her to start acting crazy like to do things out of the ordinary in, in my head at least but it just, just made perfect sense but there's just never been any vengeful malice in her or there's Trevor never been Stackhouse. any need to there's never been any reason for it like why would they have any reason luke's been behaving great like he's been a great kid the whole time because I mean, there's literally never been reason for them to, and now. Yeah, but there's they, never any reason for anybody ever to have malice. The, uh, yeah, malice now, is not a reaction. Malice is what a does character malice trait. Mean, then? Malice I don't know is I know to do means. something to hurt or come, come against somebody, to be you know antagonistic towards somebody for the pure uh, self-derived benefit of doing so. Like yeah, malice never is had a definition a to do of that evil. Until just now, malice is a character trait. It's not a reactionary act. I think it's been there the whole time, dude. Do you see what you see what she's in charge of? How do you not see that as being like like losing the humanity in the institute? Like that to me just like To become a robot does not something that you have to have malice to be able to do. Yeah, but to to do what they're doing, you have to have some sort of la- lack of morality. Like I just I, I don't think malice has been able has even had the ability to come into it really until like until just now, like I was saying, but I'm saying, well, having maliciousness in you is a is a character trait. It's and, not a thing that you just happen to have one day. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think and I, to as a reaction say I think we all we're going to torture us, you know this what kid. I mean, I think there's I, I think there's a level to it in all of us. Just like how Tim was ready to flip out on uh, on them for killing his two like call it like killing the chief and and that other person like he was ready to flip out and like blow her leg open <laughs> you know like he was ready to shoot her but he didn't I mean yeah but Six B and Stackhouse have proven that their characters are just you know straight arrow characters about their job and just doing it. And they even get on to other people for being, you know, extra in those roles. Yeah. I don't know. So I think you're watering down the definition of malice. I think you're too particular on your definition of malice, <laughs> to be honest. But that's that's why I was saying, like, we had different views of what happened there. So I think that he had that in him from the beginning. It's, I mean, it's just... It's, I just, it's so transparent. that That particular story beat, to just be able to... Okay, so... Luke is gone. We know how that story is going to progress. You know, he's either going to be a whistleblower or he's going to come back and save people. Mm-hmm. You know, so we, can, <laughs> we, we know how that's going to go. Yeah, well, we'll come back to that. Yeah, they the, they had very short Luke periods. They're like, all right, Luke is doing this. Now let's hop to the kids. <laughs> right. But so now what do we do to handle these kids who don't have any outside help, can only help themselves, but they don't know how to help themselves? Avery's still a character that we're involved with. We need to get Avery and the kids in back half reunited. I mean, the even last week, that... though, we were thinking, like, what's he going to do? Is he even going to go to, like, because he wants to save Avery? Like, is he going to go to front and back half? We didn't even, like... But now that we know that he ends up in back half, we right. know that in, in a, from a writing standpoint, King knew that he was going to get to back half. Yeah. Now, how do I get him to back half? I mean, he could have just waited until he went to back half. Like, I think that he forced him into back half at the same time as the other people that yeah i guess i could see that being as like poor judgment on their part like i definitely wouldn't have i i thought they were just going to kill avery like i don't see why they even kept him around (laughs) because we need him as a story tool but do we yeah couldn't we have just had the power together with all the rest of them like couldn't avery have like imparted that onto them because he's the strongest one and so he had to be able to give the other kids the trigger yeah. And he can't do that if he's dead. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, they could have had another trigger, I think. That would have been just even more convenient that would to have just been, come that up would with have been, some that, random garbage. I feel you know? like that would have been a little more convenient, but I don't, I guess I just don't see this as necessarily being convenient because I feel like they could, like Avery could have had them, could have triggered them without going to back half. Well, but we find out that the only way that they're able to channel their powers is to hold hands, and right. he has to be able to show them that. He could so have with him, him in his mind, right? Like, couldn't he have told them how to do it? And then they could have, I mean, because they're affecting things with Luke, like way far away. All together. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like if Avery had told them how to do it and then they still linked up and did Avery it, would even have if Avery to, wasn't involved. Well, they didn't even want to believe him until Avery was able to get inside of Helen's head and relieve her for even just 30 seconds. 
And they were like, yeah, oh, we right. can do it. Yeah, because the and back he had half, to be right there to do that. And yeah, he couldn't have really like relieved their brainwaves from the back half. Hum, Avery the is hum of destruction the messiah in the back character. Half. He had to be there to be able to do it. And so, how do we get him there to do it? It, it the normal timetable of events does not allow for that because your average week in front halves a week. Avery's been there for maybe four days. We forget how short all of this is. That's a good point. And uh, and then. But even then, that's just the average. You might be in front half for as much as a month. I thought Luke. I thought Avery had been there for a couple of weeks now. I thought it had been like two weeks because Luke had been there a month before anything happened. Like before he, he broke yeah, out, maybe he'd been there for a month. Maybe so. Maybe Avery's been there for a week. But I think but they still, say that still not the, long. Yeah, it, it, you know, <laughs> Your the, point is, the yeah. normal timetable of events for front half is like I think they say average a week, sometimes as much as a month. Yeah, and then. Certainly with everything that's going on, that timetable would probably get extended because they got to mm-hmm. figure out what to do about getting Luke back or finishing him off. Mm-hmm. And then we can get the normal flow going back after we report to, you know, head office. And what do we do about that? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, now yeah. we're back in the grind. And then, uh, so say, you know, that adds even just another week. So he's got three weeks until he gets to back half. Everything that's happening with Luke is going to happen within the span of like two or three days at most which if it takes you know a week and a half at the minimum for Avery to get to back half that doesn't line up with all the events happening with Luke we have to get Avery there now storytelling yeah no that's a good I mean even yeah short of the train taking like a week to get there you know like I don't know how they could have extended the uh the story beats to to take place simultaneously Mm -hmm. that's a good point certainly with how critical it is for the institute to get Luke back or annihilate him Mm -hmm. which is why they you know have this plan take effect immediately once they figure out where he is they get down to him in like a day which and so like all of that has to happen immediately because if it took too long it would just be absolutely unbelievable yeah and so that in for then the catalyst of everything to be happening at the institute the uprising at the institute also has to happen as quickly Mm -hmm. and the mechanic to get avery back there to be the messiah character is we're mad let's torture him and force him in the back half which is just not only an out of character reaction for those two people, it's out of character for the way that the Institute even runs in the way that I just explained where like the, the normal timetable is substantially longer than that. Yeah. I definitely agree that it's out of character for the way the Institute runs. Like that's definitely not protocol. <laughs> like they were definitely just fudging around with that, with how they do things for that particular kid. Which I'm sure they've done before, you know, like, it, you know, this is just obviously not the story they're telling. They're telling this one. <laughs> He's right, telling yeah. this story. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's been other oversights like that in the past that like just nothing happened because nobody broke out or, you know, and not necessarily saying that like, you know, Stackhouse or, or the other guy that I can't remember. Um, not saying that it was them that did anything. It's just like it could have been, you know, any any number of people because they're, they're like the, the actually the truly malicious ones that we know of like uh like zeke he's he's like renowned as mm-hmm. like a you know a shitty person so um i don't know i guess i guess it could be like that that was um <laughs> it could, i mean i think it's just obvious and and obviously if you break down anything you can get to the point where or you can figure out why things went this way for the sake of progressing the story this is just very transparent. Okay. Which isn't a problem <laughs> in the middle of a book right? that is, you know, the, the, the sum of all of its parts is much greater than that one small thing. <laughs> it's just obvious and it stands out because it's obvious. Yeah. I just don't think it's out of character. It might be obvious, but it still felt like it was in character for those guys, even as out of practice, you know, as, as it should have never happened because it's not protocol. Um, how did you feel about, uh, I, so when Luke first got into the North Carolina, I can't remember the town, um, or the state even that uh, he's going to, where, where he goes to meet up with Tim on accident. Dupre's in South Carolina. Dupre. Okay. And, um, so when he was going to Dupre, like initially, I thought for sure that like, that a big twist was going to be not necessarily a twist twist is the wrong word, but like that a big, you know, thing in the story was going to be that like the homeless lady was actually like their spy. Oh. <laughs> like in my, in, I was convinced for like, I was a hundred percent like, Oh shit. Like she's got Luke now. <laughs> like mm. I thought he was done. 
Right. And uh, and then it turns out she's like the voice of reason or something. Like she doesn't right. say anything that's the voice of reason. But I she, would, whenever she, we were getting down there and I was like, of course they're going to have a person in Dupre, even though it's, you know, a town <laughs> of 1600 and literally there's no reason for anybody to be a stringer in Dupre. But because that's where our other main character is, there's going to be a stringer in Dupre. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, well, maybe it's the sheriff because Dupre is also the county seat of that county, which is literally the only important part of it, that town. <laughs> and so why not it be the most important person in that town? Yeah. Uh, so and then it just ended up being, you know, the hotel owner, which ended up making a little bit more sense looking back and seeing how nobody's ever there. How does he keep that place running if he's not getting money? Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, I so forgot that's how that was something that was very like briefly mentioned in right. the beginning. Yeah, that was the thing that we were looking for in the beginning. Right. That I was yeah. like, I need to find my little my <laughs> something little, here is going to tip us off to something later. Something's important right here. Right, <laughs> makes it you know a little bit more obvious in hindsight, but you know whatever. Yeah, that's. But the, I was thinking maybe the sheriff because you know that's the a most good important thought. person. And he felt so lovable and town. like rational and right. Level it seemed like more of like a betrayal to be like. Oh, he's the bad guy. It, yeah, it would have been know. a crazy betrayal. Whereas it guy. being the hotel dude, like we never liked him from the get go. Yeah. He was annoying. <laughs> well, that's, that's why I was a little sad when I convinced myself it was the Annie. Uh, geez, why can't I remember her Annie. name? Annie the mm -hmm. Annie the. Uh, we call her Orphan Annie. Just orphan because Annie. Annie the Orphan. She's just like by herself yeah, or whatever. Even but, though she's uh, a you know fifty five year old woman. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was convinced it was the Orphan Annie though, because like, I mean, just because. I mean, it was all these like. There would have been no way to contact her, though. I mean, she doesn't keep phones. a phone. I mean, I just, I just mm -hmm. had a feeling that like she, she was just batshit, you know, like in that like she would have a pager or she'd have like some or she'd call on like a, like I thought that that was why they had, you know, like payphones or something in the town. Like even though, I don't think they mentioned that being payphones. <laughs> I think the only mention of phones is that you can't have phones in the institute. <laughs> like you right, can't have a yeah. cell phone there. Only mm -hmm. landlines. Um, so you're right. That would have been hard to contact her, but I, I didn't put it past the, um, the Institute as like, as that being a thing that would stop them from having her be the stringer. <laughs> I guess right. I didn't think about it. I just was like, worried. <laughs> I got worried when he just trusted her with Luke and I guess I should have trusted her character because she, I mean, that's the thing too, is I should have been paying attention to everybody's character, like personality more a little bit just to see mm -hmm. what fits like the character bill the whole time because like you know our two main characters we obviously have faith in them being uh tried and true throughout even even if they have maybe a little bit of um like self-serving tendencies like you know an eye for an eye type deal you know like if they right. have a little bit more of that but like they're still with righteous intent whereas uh with annie like she'd always just been a sweet older lady you know like misunderstood um into the conspiracies you know like she's like the crazy cat lady almost you know it's like right has good intentions and if she sees your cat she's not going to take it she's just going to pet your cat you know like she's, <laughs> yeah she's just like the misunderstood lady you know mm -hmm. so like i, I and i <laughs> i'm key number one like misunderstanding her like i immediately thought like she's gonna betray us just like maureen did right <laughs> and then she never did and um at least she hasn't yet yeah just that i mean i really should have just trusted the you know annie's character personality that we had gotten to know through the whole story like she she tried to she fixed up the sign with uh with tim to mm -hmm. you know help out the town like she imported and now she's in good standing with the cops and she can like sleep in the alley <laughs> you know like she's because right. it's getting cold like i should have just trusted that like if you know if if Tim likes her, I should have liked her. Just like how, you know, I I hopped right on board with liking Kalisha just because Luke was in love with her. Even though, like, right. she had, she was kind of like a, I don't want to say like a punk because she wasn't. Like, she was just, she had a little bit like an attitude, but that's like a kid. Right. She was just like a, she was just a fun kid with some, mm -hmm. it was some attitude. It was likable attitude, you know, it was just, right. um, and I should have. And I and I wholeheartedly trusted Kalisha. And then, and then I, last week I was talking uh, about that, uh, the girl that. Um, wanted to play horse with Luke, right? Wasn't it a girl? Like, uh, yeah, I think that was Frida Brown, the yeah, one who ends then, up betraying Avery. Exactly. And I was, and I was, I spent time last week worrying about her, and here she goes betraying everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> I shouldn't have liked her at all. <laughs> to be fair, though, we only spent one book with Annie and Tim and everybody there. That's true. And, uh, and, and though I guess the only person 
in Dupre who even felt seedy was the hotel owner. You know, he just seemed right. like a busybody. He ran this hotel that he didn't give a shit about. <laughs> everybody else at least seemed earnest. Make sense you know, like everybody in, in the police office seemed like they were, you know, like yeah. good people. I was quick to like all of them. Right. And and he seemed like a relatively good person. But we spend a really short time with them. The only reason that we trust Tim is because we are Tim, effectively. <laughs> we are Tim, yeah. We and, are Tim. But then we spend a ton of time with the people at the Institute, obviously. We spend no time at all with Frida. We literally get that one interaction with Luke. And that's why I thought it might be important because, like, it seemed like she might have had some sort of impact on on Luke just mm-hmm. because she she liked him as a as a character. Um, but you know, now I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if he's even going to try and save her. Like, I don't know if Frida's on the dark side because she she made a deal that like, hey, if I if I give you good info, I feel info, like that's not going to matter a whole lot. I think it's just going to be think... like a, a super quick interaction. So like, if the scenario is, is that we save all the kids, right? Frida then... included or no? Well, I think what's going to happen is going to be like a super quick interaction okay. where like we Luke finds out that she betrayed Avery mm-hmm. and that's why, you know, Avery gets in trouble and blah, blah, blah. But then at the same time, um, that was what gets Avery into back half to start the revolution. Mm-hmm. So do they do this thing where like, well, you're a shitbag for doing so, but if that hadn't happened the revolution wouldn't have happened and so we'll just overlook it because it all all's well it ends well or is it a thing where like there he does you know decide to be vindictive in that moment and mm-hmm. they get rid of her or whatever or if they do cut a deal with stackhouse and sigsby where they can you know spare them if do, do they do like the kind of lazy thing where just like well if you want to be with them, fucking be with them. We're leaving, you know, or something, you know, yeah. I think it's going to be like a, a, a quick, completely inconsequential interaction, barring there being a second book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that she's going to just be one of the kids, you know, like mm-hmm. even even though she said, like, I'll join the dark side, you know, I I don't think that that's going to necessarily, I don't know. It's too hard to tell. Like, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen. So it right. it's doesn't really help or hurt to speculate but um to me it seems like it almost seems forgivable just because like everyone is kind of on their own over there and being so new in into the into the folds of the institute like it seems it seems very believable for frida to do something like that like even though we're we're kind of written to to like the kids more and uh and you were kind of be- believing in like this unity and like uh, this brotherhood and like this don't rat each other out mentality that has never been said. Nobody says don't do that. Right. It's just in my head that like, oh, we're a family, we're a team, we're all in this. Well, definitely all crummy the kids that we spend together. any time with. And that's why it was so easy for me to project it onto Frida, even though mm-hmm. that wasn't something that um, she's gone through with everybody else. You know. And, right. Um, it'll be. Yeah, it's it seems very believable that like she could have done that because it's like you know if she she probably thinks she figured more out than some of the other kids and like that it probably is futile for Luke to run and uh, and she probably knows her parents are dead and that she can't get out so she's probably thinking just about her well, own she longevity. She and, didn't and, care and, if they were dead anyways because right because she, she was living in the them. slums and yeah she was and, talking and about life how, was like, better for her at the ever since she got to the yeah it's literally there, better because she wasn't I mean she was probably getting beat or at the very least you know punished for abused too yeah yeah she was getting or at least at the institute she's getting you know you get smacked around if you disobey right and the tests aren't fun but she was you know it it just says that she was being abused by all of the men that her mom brought home and her mom was also just like a dope idiot as well yeah and i think and i think it was it just, just like an like, awful situation I, yeah i was saying like the most recent one made her like lift her shirt up to see if she was developing yet but right like, yeah but so we know that some of it was a little sexual like sexual how abuse. far down that path exactly. it got they don't say because it's relatively unimportant <laughs> it is really it's it is not, unimportant it's not a path that we need to go down for this narrative no um, because it's easy but to it, believe it that shows her. that her life at the Institute is better than her life was back at home. Yeah. So it, it's very easy to, to wrap your head around her because I don't even think of it as a betrayal, you know, it, it is, yeah. it very much is a betrayal because we're, we are losing. If you subscribe to <laughs> but, the idea that it's kids versus adults at the right, Institute, right. Then where it feels really like the it, situation is truly kind of all for kids one. out for themselves. And 
because banding together literally has no benefit other than comfort until the point when you when know we they learn figure that out that we can fight back you yeah know? and that yeah that that's a which great requires point. back half you can't even do that in front half right that no that's a great point too because I, I never even thought about like I, I i bet that's part of like like i keep trying to make it a real institute like i bet that's part <laughs> of how they help like they hold these kids there and why there hasn't been a revol- uh, rev- like a revolution or an overthrowing before because like it is kind of every man for themselves or every you know kid for themselves mm-hmm. and um you know that's probably why nothing had gone wrong because not that all the kids are like frida or anything but just that and here i am making it out like frida's a bad person i don't think she is like i don't think she's inherently evil just like how we were saying that not i don't know if really the people in the institute are inherently evil cuz they they're brainwashed to think that they're doing the greater good but they're right. doing it they well, I think justify in, the means in either you know? case i don't think that kids can necessarily be inherently good or bad anyways because they are lacking mental and emotional development that would inform decisions that you would make that then would make you either a good or bad person yeah and obviously these kids have been through more than your average kid of that age Mm -hmm. but they're still you know lacking the inherent benefits of having lived (laughs) yeah that would then inform your character and, and so forth and so on so i don't i don't think any of them could inherently be good or bad to begin with. Right. Okay. Yeah. Unless the storytelling wants to say so for the sake of storytelling. Yeah. Like how. But from a realistic perspective and in the fact that this story takes place in a real, uni- you know, a realistic universe. Mm-hmm. I think we then have to put realistic attributes to people and kids are not inherently good or bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're just children that are still developing into people that can become good or bad. Yeah. I keep, I keep relating everything and because King is so like he's had kids like he's been a father like a, he, he might even be a grandfather at this point like i don't i don't know and mm-hmm. and you know he's been through just like the amount of like i feel like having a conversation with him and him putting in all of this work into learning all the different mechanisms of a different people kids adults and 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 i almost feel like he's got his own sort of sociology psychology degree cuz like he he built this like institute and here I am every week, keep trying to make it like, this is probably why it works because <laughs> like <laughs> right. they made a mistake last week because they told uh, Luke that, you know, it's this last, this, this is the last time we're going to dunk you, you know? And then that's a mental thing where if you know how, you know, last week right. where I made mm-hmm. that a big deal. It, I don't know. I don't know if the, he's even meaning to put these things in there, but because he's so, I feel like inherently, uh, not even philosophical but like inherently like just thinking in these perspectives like he's Mm -hmm. he's so maybe introspective and how do you say introspective you know what i mean like he thinks (laughs) of other people's perspective on things and Mm -hmm. and he's just i don't know it's just been a really well-crafted story to the point where i am saying like this is why the institute is working because they're doing these psychological games (laughs) And I don't even know if he wrote those psychological games intentionally. Like, I right. think it could have just been something that since he's been all over the mind for so long, he just was like, this is how the Institute would work. And then when he wrote it out, I'm able to analyze it and make it into all these other right, yeah. psychology things that I've heard of. And mm-hmm. man, it's just, he is so good. I would love to talk to King. Just like, I don't <laughs> even know what I would talk to him about because I'd get so nervous. Like, I get nervous talking to anybody and just right. like, I'd be so nervous. Yeah, what, I'd, I'd probably end up talking to him about his house. What does he house. talk about? I'd probably end up talking to him about his like house and grandkids <laughs> and like, <laughs> and like uh, how he goes walking every day. Like he goes for a walk every day. I, I, don't, mm. I don't even feel like I'd have any questions for him. Like a real hardcore, like lifelong King fan would have, but right. he would just be so much fun to talk to. And I would love him on Joe Rogan or something. Cause Rogan's a huge King fan too. But he'd be interesting to talk to him. Oh, for sure. I, want, I, I wonder what he just talks about. I, I mean, he's obviously just a person, right? That's, <laughs> and then when I think when I think about that too, it's like I wonder if he's like a lot of other older people, and he's just talking about politics a lot. Like I feel right. like pe- older people are always talking about politics, and I don't know if that's just like a more mature thing to talk about, <laughs> or if like it's just what they're worried about now, or because right. this book hasn't brought it much politics into it at all. Like he's made. He he brought up Hillary Clinton once because well, he there's was been quoting some something relatively heavy-handed things. A couple, yeah. There's, <laughs> it, he all but calls out the Trump fan base. Oh no, he did. I remember. Yeah, uh, he did. You know, aside from literally <laughs> saying Trump, he he. I mean, he deliberately doesn't say Trump because for to to start saying things about a sitting president is 
uh, you, you get into weird territory. But, we all knew who he's talking about. Well, yeah, obviously, because it's the, <laughs> the guy that ran against Hillary. He literally says Hillary Clinton's name because she's not a sitting president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but he, he pretty much all but literally calls out the Trump fan base. There was something else. Um, there was another political reference uh, where he was sort of, you know, it was. It seemed evident to me that he is of a left leaning nature. Me too. I got that vibe because I mean he brought up like the Hillary Clinton um, slogan, "Stronger Together," you know, and, right? And that, that's as what, a sort that's of what like the kids a, are. a relation point for specifically for Kalisha because it exactly. was just a bumper sticker that her mom had. It, but and that's even silly for me to bring up because that doesn't mean that he's left leaning. But right, <laughs> just because but he remembers the the, the context <laughs> that he then puts other things into right. it, 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 it definitely points. Yeah, out, yeah. Um, but he's not outright saying healthcare should be free. You know, he's not, yeah, he's not he's, saying that sort of stuff, exactly. but it definitely does feel like if you were to ask him what his politics were, you, you might be able to say that he would, you, you might be able to anticipate that he would say Democrat, you know? Right. Yeah. You could like, kind of tell from the book, but yeah, even though it had those kind of things and you could sort of tell where, which way he, I don't think he's he, making any statements. That's exactly where I was going. I don't feel like he is making any statements and, mm -hmm. and you sort of feel like you can tell where he's going. Sort of like a cheeky thing, like sort of like, exactly. well, those guys are idiots, you know, just like a little cheeky. Exactly. But, uh, he's not trying he's, to change anybody's mind. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what it, yeah. No statements, just a little, a little tongue in cheek stuff. And I, you know. I think it's pretty well done. Like, I don't think it's yeah, over it's heavy handed fine. or anything. It's fine. You know, it's not good or bad. It doesn't hurt. The only reason that it stands out to me is because these are current times. Exactly. That's the only reason. And so I know. these are things that are, have just only very recently happened mm -hmm. or, and even in some cases are immediately happening. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it stands out. Cause it's like, Oh yes, I am very familiar with that because that just happened. <laughs> right. That's that, that. Whereas if this was a book that took place in the seventies and he was making the exact same kind of references it, and we jokes, wouldn't even be it would not about have it. any of the same kind of weight because I don't have any personal reference for those things. Oh yeah. It would be hard to talk about. I, don't I may even, even still notice. be able to say, well, it still feels like he's leaning left because he's talking about, Whatever. you know, he's, he's, you know, not trashing JFK or something like right. that, you know, but I still wouldn't, it wouldn't stand out in the way that it stands out just because it's literally present day stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, I mean, that being said, it, it does seem like, I, I don't feel like that. That would be a crazy huge part of his conversation. I just feel like he'd just be the most normal guy ever. Like you'd want something dark right. to come out of his mouth and he'd just, <laughs> and he'd just be like, Oh, I saw my grandkids play soccer. <laughs> You yeah, know, right. it's like, oh, cool. And then he's like, and then I went home and wrote my book, my my new book that's coming out for four hours or however long. This is, dude, and just because it's so, it feels like it's current too. It, I know we talked about it the last two weeks, but mm -hmm. that's another aspect of this book that's very satisfying for me. It's not like I'm looking back on a classic. I'm I'm enjoying a future classic. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's too soon to even call it that, but right. in my mind, it will be. It'll be a book I'll recommend, you know, and mm -hmm. may maybe in 30 years, I'll, I'll be able to say like, oh, did you ever check out the, I wonder if that one, you know, I wonder how it feels politically and I'll compare it to Stephen King's new book. <laughs> right. Yeah. It'll, and I guess you could probably say this about anything, but it would be interesting to see how it stands later. Yeah, it definitely um, will be because right it, now uh, it feels like it's not necessarily timeless, but it feels like it's, it'll hold you know, hold its value just like how Salem's Lot did. Yeah. It'll be, I wonder if there was, and it would be, you know, almost by nature, almost impossible to come up with a list like this, but if there was a list of most obscure Stephen King book, <laughs> like if, if we were to read that, would it be as good as this? And it would just be like, well, he's just a good author. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. And it, it would be fun maybe for us to explore with our with our podcast uh, one of his pen names, uh, Richard 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 Bachman is uh, his like better known pen name. Mm -hmm. And that was that was um, he wrote several novels under that pen name. And uh, is that the right term, pen name? Uh, it would be pseudonym. Pseudonym. Thank you. Um, he wrote it under that pseudonym to see if it was just his name that was selling the books or if it was actually his writing. And uh, mm -hmm. those books ended up doing really well. They did obviously way better after he, it came out. That right. Was King, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they did do well as, mm -hmm. you know, a, good that, enough for him to be like, all right, the experiment's over. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> he, he wrote like four or five books as Bachman. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I can't wait for these last 
section, this last section, these last two books, just because I'm glad to see how it wraps up. Yeah, man. And I don't think I'm going to be able to guess it. Like, I think I'm going to be able to guess some of it, obviously, but it, I mean, I think it's going to have a King ending just like I say that. I mean, just like we always speculate and try and figure it out. I mean, right. Like it's not going to, you know, and like we said, either last week or the week before, maybe both weeks that it, you know, it's it's not going to have like a bow tie on it. It's not going to be like super pretty or anything. And it's going to be feel very vaguely, real. you know, kind of like vaguely satisfying. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's that's kind of the beauty of of his writing too. Is and I think what made a lot of people fall in love with Game of Thrones and stuff is that it's like it's the it's probably the real way that it's more realistic to how things would actually happen. It's not just like your cookie cutter, you know, the good will prevail. You know, right? Because even as we've been talking about this whole episode. I don't think those people are inherently doing evil. Like, you know, they're doing bad stuff, but it's not right. inherently Maybe evil. Morally they genuinely, bankrupt, exactly. But, they know, genuinely they're... think that they're helping the, the world, you mm-hmm. know? And, uh, and that, that I think is going to be a concept that he smacks us with at the end. Like they might, the Institute might not even be overrun, you know, just like at the end of Watchmen, like <laughs> they didn't win at all. Like they, right. you know, the guy, the bad guy won and he's like, it's for the greater good, you dummy. <laughs> and then we're like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess. <laughs> and then you're mm-hmm. kind of sad, but it's right. like, all right, whatever. I, you know, I have a feeling it might be something like that. Like, I don't want to even predict that because then I'll be sitting here waiting for that to happen. Right. <laughs> but I, I, I can't wait. I, it's, it's, that's one of those things like books and, and gifts that people buy for you. It's just like, you can't start anticipating an ending that you want or a present that you want. You just have to like be excited for whatever it is and enjoy it as it comes. Cause mm-hmm. otherwise to just get disappointed by like a surprise, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. At least that's, at least that's how I, how I work. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's, I mean, there's only a very small handful of ways that it can go, I think. And I think, you know, the ones that I mentioned earlier, right. What is the deal that gets struck or struck that they're going back for what's right now? What's the deal with Vasher? Is, yeah, what's the deal with Vasher? <laughs> I still don't really know. The um, it, is it something that either side intends to honor? Because they both sort of seem like they're not going to try and honor any actual deal. <laughs> but they're just they just want to get each other in the vicinity of each other so they can for over. the you know underhanded you know action that they're going to take. Okay, I'm glad um, that was. I'm glad that I felt the same way. <laughs> it just seemed like, okay, why are the two bad, like, these guys aren't going to agree to, right. <laughs> agree to terms. Because, like, Stackhouse gets off the phone, and then he walks away, and he's like, I'll fucking show him who he's dealing with or something like that. He thinks he can get the better of me. Well, we'll see. Yeah. And then the the literal last line of the last chapter, like I already said, Luke Luke's like, Stackhouse thinks I'm coming to him, but I'm coming for him. It's like, okay, yeah. so so you're both, like, the 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 deal is just, like, you both you know, underhandedly getting each other to come to each other. And then you're both going to try and trick the other one into getting what you want and not letting the other thing happen. Yeah. So then maybe just everybody dies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I want to believe that Luke is <laughs> three steps ahead like he is in chess, but mm-hmm. I mean, he's going up against pretty, I mean, he's, he's going back into their home, home, home field, adv- you know, like they right. have home field advantage again. I mean, but maybe they don't because the kids, <laughs> The kids right. might be running the show, but then, you know, maybe see, that's one thing too, is like, what if the kids get corrupted? Because like, like what if by using their powers, they kind of become more brain dead and then they become like a hive mind. And then one of them is the corrupt, like, what if Avery is more corrupt than we think? And then they sort of join this hive mind and then, um, they're all just like fueling the, uh, the whims of a single person instead of like the greater good of the world, which I mean, well, that's, if we, if we I boil it down, that that's, that's pretty probably much what exactly they, what's already happening. <laughs> that's what I, that's, as I was saying, and I was like, that's probably exactly what's happening anyway. But I guess, I guess it's just who's, I guess who's, in, who's going to be, who's standing over the ashes, right? right. Like who's, who's going to win at the I think end? the vagueness of the conclusion of the story is about morality. Like you said, okay. I think that's what the vagueness is going to be. So All right, like, that'll be satisfying then. I think one side over the other definitively survives. Like okay. either the kids win, mm-hmm. maybe some of them die, whatever, or the uh, adults win and nothing changes, or all these kids are dead. 
And so then they start over with the new batch. But there's like, I think that the, the vagueness is the morality. Yeah. I think that there's a winner. I don't think that they just go their separate ways. I I have a feeling that like, m- like Luke and maybe one of the other kids are going to survive. I don't, I don't think Tim will make it. And I don't think most of the kids will make it. I th- for some reason, I think Luke will, which he has, he's not safe just because he's the main character. Like, mm-hmm. But I have a feeling that he's going to make it. And then that's going to be when we get hit with like the morality, because at the end, I think the Institute's still going to be running. I don't yeah. think, I don't think they're going to take over the Institute. Like, I think that'll be the big twist kind of like the battle with morality is, right. is exact. I think, well, yeah. I think the thing is, is that there's those people that Sigsby reports to the, whoever that <laughs> yeah. person is on the other side of the of, phone with the lisp. Like short we, of taking it down all right. the way. They would, there's no way that they can, even if they kill literally every person that first handedly works at the Institute, there's still the greater power that can reinstitute on the, the Institute. other side of the phone. Yeah. You know? So like, you know, how do you, how do you beat the shadow government or whatever that entity is? Yeah. And that's, the kids can't do that. Not in this book. It doesn't feel like we're going to Not be in able the to. remaining pages that we have, which is <laughs> little. Yeah. So and, I think that, I, I think that you're right. Probably. Probably the majority of the kids die. Uh, maybe, probably Tim dies because kind of whatever. I, the only reason I said that was because I didn't want it to end in the exact same way like Salem's Lot, right. where it's the old guy and the I kid. I think Tim has been set together. up to be a person who it, it does not really hurt anybody except for a little bit of emotion on Wendy and Luke's part that he would die. He's got no True. family. He's oh, got no point. real job. He's got no establishment or anything. Mm-hmm. There's like, there's, he's, he's basically a drifter. Yeah. He so him like, dying to, you know, use the last bit of his life for this, you know, what we perceive to be the good goal mm-hmm. would be, would make sense for his character. And then maybe Luke goes back and, you know, lives with Wendy and do prayer or something like that. Like, who knows? There you but, go. Okay. I but then it also doesn't make a whole lot of sense for Luke. Although I guess he has to live under the radar because without toppling the system to the point where he can prove his innocence about his parents, uh, which we've already decided won't happen because how do you beat the shadow government? <laughs> the he, he can't then pursue his dream of being super smart and researching at two colleges at the same time. Yeah. Because then they'd be like, unique. oh, that's a very smart kid. We should find out more about that kid hey, who sounds there... a lot like the kid who murdered his parents. A couple you know? years ago. Aren't yeah. you the same age as that kid? <laughs> right. So he can't do anything ostentatious. Right. He just has to, you know, uh, be the new become used owner. to living, uh, you know, a, an average life, which he'd probably be thankful for after everything that he's been through. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, that's another so thing too. So goes back like... with Wendy to Dupre. That, that, honestly, I could see... I could see that being the end, like that they, that they kind of win, <laughs> you right. know, that like that, that maybe they stopped this it's institute. Like got out of the institute. Yeah. They got, didn't they have got, to die. You know? <laughs> yeah. Luke got out, didn't have that's to die. <laughs> and then that's probably the thing is that like, he's going to be going back to Dupre with, um, shoot, you just said Wendy. Name. Wendy, thank you. Mm-hmm. And I think that, yeah, that's a good guess. That's really good. Because I think that'll leave it open ended if the institute's still around. Maybe not our institute, but like if the shadow government that's running the the bigger picture, you know, if they're still mm-hmm. around, like we're speculating, then uh, I don't think that he'll necessarily write a second book. But that would leave the room for that like open ended future of, uh, of right. these characters still continuing on, and maybe maybe in a different book that he writes, he'll have a fun little throwback to this book, you know, or maybe right. he's already had a throw forward to this, you know, so, you know? Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, mm. I think it's good. I, I, dude, that's a great guess though. You did a good job with that, especially with the, the, him going with, with, uh, Wendy at the end. That was, hmm. for it's, some reason in my head, I was like, oh, there you go. That's, <laughs> that's the end. It ending. seems like in a, in a world where we don't kill Luke. Okay. It would make too little sense for both Tim and Wendy to die. Being the only two adults on his side in their current <laughs> position, yeah, that's uh, a good point. Leaving Dupre, um, yeah, because then, then Luke one of them has to live because otherwise, then Luke lives in the woods for the rest of his life. Like, yeah, <laughs> like under the radar, trying to constantly on the run from the right. Institute. He's got to have some sort of adult sponsorship, <laughs> and like I said, I think that Tim is a perfect character for being killed. Mm-hmm. He's one that we care enough about just because we've been him. Yeah, and but then. 
you know, for, for all the reasons that I already put forward, he, he's a he's a character that would be perfect for dying in this, you know, last mm-hmm. little scuffle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, but, you know, Luke and the Avester live and maybe Kalisha and, you know, they figure out some sort of situation for them in a, an adjacent town of Dupre or even in a different state where they have like, you know, somebody they know an orphanage that they can get them in with that, you know, doesn't mind not finding out their identity or something like that. Mm-hmm. But most of the kids die. Luke lives because it would be, I feel like it'd be weird to kill Luke. And then, so then mm-hmm. how does he live? He goes with Wendy, the adult who's on his side who didn't die. Yeah. <laughs> if that's the way that it, if, if it goes down the route of just not complete mutually assured destruction, I feel like that's kind of the only way that it can go. Yeah. Do you think we'll get a phone call from the, uh, the, the big boss we'll hear from list man i think that we have to if six b and um what's his name live head of security mm-hmm. uh trevor stackhouse if, if stackhouse and six b or even just one of them survive the last confrontation then yes okay but not before you don't think no okay because they're still they don't want to contact they don't want to use the zero phone until and, there's literally no choice. Right. That's what I was... I guess that maybe that was my real question. Like, do you think that they'll end up being in a no turning back type? I mean, I think mm-hmm. that they're going to end up in a no turning back type situation where they should have probably called, but right. they obviously don't want to throw their lives right. away. Yeah, that's their what, lives are also, literally in danger. It seems like, yeah, suicide by, note by calling. this yeah. in its current state, you exactly, know? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Certainly now that they're in a negotiation situation, if they were to call... If they were to use the zero phone at this point and be like, yeah, we're in a negotiation situation with an escapee. He's already told several people what's going on. Yeah, and we killed a bunch <laughs> and of cops And two in a of small our extraction town. teams are dead mm-hmm. in a small town where they killed several cops. Zero phone would be like, all right, now you're all dead. <laughs> yeah. <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> He'd use whatever power. It, so right. they, Stackhouse they would is already considered that. grabbing his passports and running, you know? Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, yeah. except for that Luke will <laughs> get into done. trouble. Right. Yeah. Short of, yeah, short of that, like, I think that's the, like, because that's what's keeping him, right? Like, just that, that He Luke initially didn't do it because he has this sense of loyalty to Sigsby, yeah. uh, which it, you know, outright says. I, it, whenever we're in his head for, like, a couple of chapters, mm-hmm. he says something about, like, you know, the only reason I'm not grabbing my passports and money that I have stashed away to a destination that's already waiting for me to show up is because I have loyalty to Sigsby. And I'm like, okay, I guess you're just stating facts that let us know why you're not doing the obvious thing. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's kind of like, well, there was never any buildup to us understanding that he has loyalty. We're just being told he has loyalty, (laughs) but whatever. But yeah, he obviously should have just run by now. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like, duh. (laughs) Yeah. I wonder how long you can, yeah, dude. How long can you run for the, from psyops <laughs> like the right. psychic, the psychic warriors? I mean, I don't know mm-hmm. if there are any adults that have the psychic. Well, they've power, also but they're sort of shown it to some ability. that they've shown that all you have to do is just literally tell them, "Eh, I don't care what you have to say to me." Like if you can expect the psychic attack, you can resist it pretty easily. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't think about so that. They've already established that, so I don't know how they, you know, beat them. From that standpoint, you know, mm-hmm. unless bringing Luke into the ring as well is the last unknown piece of the puzzle. Yeah, like there's some that then lets them overcome that barrier. But yeah, because I, I mean, they hinted at there being other powers than TK and TP. So like, maybe that'll be revealed no. in the last. I mean, it <laughs> seems far fetched that another thing would be revealed unless it's literally like at the last section I like think that when, was just, like if luke goes in and is the catalyst that like makes it happen then he would probably be bringing in a new power but what would that but, even be just literal spontaneous combustion or something like uh, that like for control i'm just kidding <laughs> hive mind he could control the hive i have no idea i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but just, for, for uh, uh, them saying what if there were other you know, powers is just literal flavor text for why Dr. Hendrix is doing the experiments that are outside of what their actual mission is. Or, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Yeah, that could be it. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, I mean, we've already written several endings for this. <laughs> Let's see which one it comes out right. to. 
Yeah. I hope one of ours is right, even though I'm going to be sitting there the whole time listening like, <laughs> did we get it? Oh, of course right. we didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll find out. There's yeah. only two chapters left to read. As we've said a couple of times, it's um, notably less than the previous two weeks worth of reading. Um, not dramatically less, but notably. Yeah. Uh, so we'll finish it up pretty quickly, I imagine. And uh, then we'll use whatever time left next episode talking about whatever the next book is, which we've yet to determine, obviously. Yeah. Onward. We'll have to figure that out. Yeah, that uh, the the book that I was thinking won't be out until the end of the month. Mm. So, um, so if we end up going with that one, we'll have to hold off again. <laughs> yeah, we'll be waiting again, and it might not even fit because it's supposed to be spooky. So that was oh, kind of going to be fun gonna let too. It be for... like a spooky October thing. Yeah, I mean, it didn't necessarily have to be spooky October, but I mean, it was going to be fun <laughs> if right, we had gotten yeah. it in for Halloween. Yeah, maybe we can do some some fun. But I don't know. We'll be thinking about it all week. Right. Yeah. We'll uh, figure it out. We'll let y'all know. Obviously, that's how this show works. But yeah. Yeah. So we're going to just finish the book. I'm pretty sure there's not an epilogue, but if there's a hidden epilogue that we didn't see initially, do that. We're finishing the book. Yeah. Are you reading anything on the side? No. No? Don't have any time now that football has started. Oh, uh, yeah. I yeah, I went back to the library after uh, after getting my card, mm -hmm. and uh, I rented the Fahrenheit 451 um, graphic novel just because I, want, I had already read the book back in seventh or eighth grade mm -hmm. and i wanted the story again but not to have to read so much dialogue i wanted a lot of pictures and fun right you yeah. know and uh it's silly because i've read so much manga that like <laughs> i'll read the the bubbles of the like this the voice bubbles in the wrong order sometimes just because oh, i'm so yeah, used to reading it right. from the other direction mm -hmm. uh, but uh you know it's i do that it, constantly yeah it's a it's a fun read though uh, just because i already know the story and I, I liked the story so this is just a fun little grab at it i think it would have been fun to have a 1984 graphic novel too, just give you that story but with fun pictures and especially if you've already read it and then i'm also reading this book um it's about like the first uh police chief in paris mm. um it's just like yeah he, he he brings lights to the city um just like he's it's it's the birth of like taking pride in like your city and like him taking pride in paris and then like making it the city of lights and and cleaning up pollution and uh just because everyone was throwing their trash on the streets and right. there weren't any lights and it was super sketchy and dangerous to walk around and now it's the city of lights literally known throughout the world as the city of lights it's a lot cleaner and um and then he starts like to go after like i think maybe the first serial killer ever or something like that it was just it, it, in paris mm -hmm. it, it just it sounded really cool it grabbed me and uh I don't know. There's mm. there's a lot of good reading out there. So neat. yeah, I'm gonna try and knock those out before next week. So those those won't be the books that we'll be picking, but right. it's just fun to talk about. And that's what I'm reading right now. Yeah. So I am still I'm very excited. slowly working on Red Seas. Is, how's it coming? Is it good? Uh, it's. I mean, it's good. I just yeah. don't have the time to read. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's one that I keep forgetting to hop into because we already know those guys. Right. And I think about them. <laughs> I know that's silly. I think about these guys that we've talked about in all of our podcasts like all the time. Like yeah. <laughs> especially freaking Vasher. All the time I bring <laughs> I bring him up. Especially with what you. What is his deal? But like anytime somebody's like, What's the deal? I'm just like, Oh yeah, what is Vasher's deal? <laughs> <It's> always <laughs> But yeah, just like all these guys and girls and characters that we've had we've had this uh now, there's books that I want to read, but then I think, no, I need to finish Red Seas so that I can then finish that series. <laughs> and then I think about how I haven't even finished the second book and how long that's taken me and I want to finish the whole fucking series. That's, yeah. And the problem is that I just spend too much time doing other things and, in yeah, my it's... free time. And if I actually wanted to finish the book, then I would then use my free time to finish the book. But yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's hard. When... My priorities are elsewhere. Yeah. But whatever. Hey, you're still reading. Yeah, at the very least, I'm getting my reading done you're for this. Definitely reading. So. Well, anyways, yeah. we'll see you all next week. Uh, Y'all know how to find us, just the normal ways, um, you know, like and subscribe, uh, let us know what books you want to read, give us some input, We, I mean, we'll read anything, so just like, let us know, we'll check it out, and um, yeah, Instagram and face, or Instagram and uh, Twitter, ears underscore stamps, and dog ears and timestamps at gmail.com, mm -hmm. let us know how you feel, yeah. and uh, yeah, we'll see y'all next week. Yep. I'm Will Hedrick. I'm Jordan Schaffer. This is dog ears and timestamps. Go Astros. <laughs>